This is the most digital native generation that we've ever had. They feel bad in many ways that they don't have the personal freedoms, the privacy, the things yeah. that they should have as children. They should be able to make mistakes. Zoomers are a generation of digital natives, meaning they've been plugged into the digital world since birth. This unprecedented change in upbringing can be hard to see for parents like me, and probably you, who spend every waking hour on a screen. But this is new and comes with serious challenges our parents didn't face or prepare us for. Take online pornography. Did you know that on average, today's kids are exposed to hardcore porn by second grade? That's a far cry from 90s teen boys trying to unscramble the Playboy channel. Then there's video games and social media. 10% of adolescents show symptoms of video game addiction, and 5 to 10% of the US population meets the criteria for social media addiction. As parents, how can we protect our kids from being on the dark side of these statistics? And how do we work with them if they already are? This is why we invited Dr. Lisa Stroman back to Dad Saves America. She's a licensed psychologist and the founder of Digital Citizen Academy, an organization addressing the issue of technology addiction and overuse. She's the author of Digital Distress, which guides parents on raising children in a digital world and includes chapters on the topics of video games, pornography, social media, and screen time management. The more you isolate someone, the more dependent they become. And so it's very interesting to me over the last decade, for instance, I've seen these children become more and more tied in and less and less social, which creates more and more anxiety and depression. And the only way to fix it is to untether them. Dr. Stroman's perspective as a psychologist and technology wellness expert offers necessary tips and tricks for keeping our kids healthy and happy, both online and IRL. I can hear my son cringing when I say IRL right now. All right, Lisa, welcome back to Dad Saves America. So happy to be back. So our last conversation, we only touched on the surface of several things that I wanted to go deeper on together. Specifically, I wanna to talk today about video games, pornography, <laughs> social media, and cyberbullying and Gen Z, who are the crazy kids we've birthed. <laughs> Wait, how many we, hours do we have? <laughs> and what do we do about them? So let's start off with Gen Z. This is the, to me, the most digital native generation that we've ever had. They grew up technologically connected at all levels. A lot of them started before birth. Parents were putting them online, right? They were setting up accounts for them before they were ever born. So it really is like a different generation, I feel, from that perspective. I really struggle because I feel bad in many ways that they don't have the personal freedoms, the privacy, the things yeah. that they should have as children. They should be able to make mistakes. They should be able to understand that the world isn't perfect. But they've grown up in this place where it's almost intolerable if they don't fit in or if they don't agree or fall in line, particularly in the technology space. Well, I was told by really smart people that they'll own nothing and, and have no privacy and be happy. I don't think they're happy. They're not happy. So tell me about that. I think generally they live day by day, right? So it's almost like being on vacation all the time. They're not really thinking long term is what we would have maybe, like putting things aside for our kids in later or we want to have retirement or those kind of things. They're more hedonistic in that way, I guess. So they, they just want to be happy and they want to be happy in that moment, which only lasts for a fleeting moment and then it goes away, which makes them even more unhappy. They're not really connected to this kind of generational lifestyle that we really need to look at if we're gonna be successful in all phases of our life. That sounds like a looking at kind of the older side, the kids that are now starting to come out of school and <laughs> wreak havoc in HR departments everywhere. <laughs> right. um, hone in on that. When you say living day to day, does any kid look look out and have perspective? So the difference, like even the younger kids, right? Like yeah. you say like, oh, I'm gonna like join the high school team or I'm gonna join my middle school or at elementary school, I'm gonna do this after school program. And I'm like, I can't wait to go see my friend, right? And you kind of look forward to things. They are so used to having things pushed into their awareness that they don't really look outward for it. Does that make sense? Oh, they, yeah, they, that's interesting. They definitely, yeah. even the younger kids are just kind of like, they wait to be told or what is important and what isn't important and what should I or should I not agree with. And I think that that happens across all of the ages. How do you know that? You know, like in our last conversation, we talked about the suicide rates, the anxiety, the depression, those are all measurable and they're high. But then these other, these personality traits you're talking about, 
they feel like a harder thing to measure. I would say that by my almost 20 years of practice, like working with the kids, speaking on a national platform, you know, going to schools, it's the same everywhere I go. I can be in Amish country in Iowa, which I have been, and I was wondering why they had me there. And they had technology related issues with their kids that were coming into the school and finding ways to get on technology as much as the, the folks out Amish and TikTok's the East Coast. big. It is, it is, <laughs> right? To me, it's the hard work of those sessions that I have individually with families, with kids, talking to parents, going into churches, all of that. That's how I have this impression of what Gen Z is. You're experiencing this across a lot of people and a lot of time frame and seeing these similarities. Right, and not just in therapy. Yeah, like in just normal, I'm going out and like trying to share what I know, help people on a grander scale. And so I don't want your audience to think it's just people who are in distress or need. It is just generally we all are in this world together. And so a lot of people have shared kind of their journey in that. You know, so my son's gonna be 18 and we're thinking about college and our show reflects my own skepticism of the value proposition of college these days. But we're still like trying to explore what to do next. How have you dealt with this sense of like listlessness or purposelessness? They don't have a plan, like you're saying, or a sense of the thing that they're passionate about that they want to do next. I always start with strengths. And I always say like, I think that you've probably done more than you've thought that you've done. Because I think when we look at kids, like they have taken in their moral ethical compass, usually by the time they're 11 or 12. They have the <laughs> ability to like make right for wrong, right? We're just at that point, the bumpers in the in the bowling alley, you know, after that. And they, they kind of should be guiding themselves. And I think that those early years are where I would say that work is done. Those kids in that generation, they do have some ability to understand, like think of an, a buffet. You can go to an all you can eat buffet. You teach your kids, right? You should moderate what you take and what you consume. For my kids and the people that I work with, I always talk about that as an analogy. It's like you need to understand that there are some things that could be offered to you in life, drugs, illicit things that you don't want to have in your life. So don't choose that, like avoid those places. And so generally, I think the parents have done the work. They just haven't connected the dots. I've heard like Jonathan Haidt has talked about that he thinks that the average 18 year old today has the emotional maturity of between a, like a 14, 15 year old of my generation. Do you agree with that? You know, how do we think about that? How do you think about that? I, I think that in some ways that's not entirely true. I think that mm. there's a tolerance issue and I think that there is a lemming issue, right? Like I think that there are a lot of people jump in and follow each other. They get uh, frenzied around an idea to become something that they aren't. In terms of emotional maturity, I think that our kids are guarded too much nowadays. Like we don't allow those boundaries down as much as we used to. And so kids don't get as much resilience built in. I tell people all the time, it's, it's okay if your kid fails, it's okay if they fall down. You can't get resilient any other way and you can't get to be a stronger human unless you've understood what it feels like to be on that other side. So I don't necessarily think that they're less mature emotionally than the generation. I think that they're definitely less tolerant, they're less open. You know, they're the first to tell you that they, they are, but the reality is, is they're not. They, they want you to hmm. believe what they believe. Before we even started doing this, as just part of like trying to work out my own thoughts, I wrote what I thought were like 10 things that constituted being an adult. They ended up being pretty stoic. A lot of it's about, can you control your emotion? Is that a useful proxy, like emotional regulation? Like how, do, how should I think about what it means to be a mature adult? I think that that's a better term, emotional regulation. How do you take in some sensory and have a reaction to it and process it before your impulse. If somebody's saying something to you or somebody's doing something to you, is your immediate reaction to like counter that argument or to say, well, that's interesting. Like, how did you get to that opinion? That's pulling in information. The emotional maturity that I think when I, originally you said that was, is this person able to value the person in front of them? Are they a uh, value the situation in front of them and be able to respond without just that, I guess, like raw emotion. That's to me, maturity. So calling people a racist the second they say anything that you disagree with is not mature. Not mature, <laughs> yeah. What role has kids' interaction with technology and with screens and, and digital connectivity played the sense in which they don't have tolerance and what does tech have to do with it? 
there's a anonymity to it, right? It's like you're driving in your car and the windows are up and you're like cussing out somebody who's driving next to you because you know they can't hear you. I think screens tend to allow that piece of them to go out and just kind of throw up their emotions into the world and like share like kind of vitriol if they have it and without any like real worry, like it just goes somewhere and they don't really have an attachment to it anymore. The other piece of it is like that they don't see themselves as, as the same individual online and in real life. So the kids are constantly telling me IRL. And I was like, I'm, you're gonna have to, you know, like in the beginning I was like, so in real life, right? Yeah. This is how I am. And so there's this like definite dichotomy where they have this digital life and then they have this in real life life that they feel like they have to, to be different for. And so you're not gonna see the same human in those situations. They wouldn't act the same. And they, and they definitely are getting closer to living in that digital world more and more. Friend of the show, Martin Gurry, former Alphabet agency guy mm -hmm. at the CIA. He's actually said that he thinks that, and he's not a psychologist, he's just sort of making an observation, that our kids are probably more sophisticated and have developed more ways of navigating the digital landscape than we, their like boomer parents. I'm not a boomer. I was just gonna say. But I am, I am called a boomer by my son. I'm like, I'm not a boomer. I grew up with Thieves and Butthead. It's a different thing altogether. Um, that we don't give them enough credit, that they actually are more sophisticated. They are developing a kind of new digital immune system. What's your experience of that? Do you, are you seeing in your practice and in your work, like a new kind of sophistication developing? I think uh, sophistication is an interesting term. I wouldn't have thought of it that way, but I think that that probably is accurate. I think to me, I look at it as a bit of an apathy, like that they just don't let things impact them anymore. And they kind of just disregard. To me, it seems like a one way feed for them. Like they want to share their vision and they want to be able to like take in what they kind of choose. And so in that respect, I would say it is more sophisticated because they just kind of ignore some of the noise, a lot of them. Jean Twenge, who wrote the book iGen and, you know, is this demographer sociologist that I know you and I've talked about. She pointed out in something I'd read from her recently that to your point about connection, you know, there's this phrase like catch the feels. It's probably already old. I'm probably already causing my son to cringe. It was by yesterday. Saying this. Done. Yeah, yeah, this is already done. This is like, that's like dabbing dad. You can't, don't say that ever again. Yeah. But that there is a kind, there is a apathy and a kind of emotional withdrawal. What have you seen with that? Mostly it's it's based on fear and insecurity that I think she's absolutely right that they're pulling back. I think that there is some kind of nefarious things that are happening, maybe intentional, maybe not intentional from algorithms and, and trying to work kids into certain areas. But the more you isolate someone, the more dependent they become. And so it's very interesting to me over the last decade, for instance, I've seen these children become more and more tied in and less and less social, which creates more and more anxiety and depression. And the only way to fix it is to untether them. At this point, if they're already so connected, they can't. So she's right that they're pulling back. She's right that they're isolating. I see a lot of kids that are joining communities like incel groups and things like that, that are like, oh, I now I have like a established place to be, but you shouldn't be in that group. You don't want your child in that group, right? It's dangerous in, in a lot of ways, but it's it's what they're doing to become more social. I think it's no surprise. They call it social media, and then they sell it as if this is a way we're gonna be more social. We're more connected. Yes, way more isolated than we ever have been. One of the things that is interesting that I've read is that this generation is actually doing less drugs and having less sex. Is that true? And how should I think about that? You turn on HBO and you see Euphoria and you're like, oh my God, we're living in a hellscape. <laughs> but then you read that and you're like, this is great. They're having less sex, less teen pregnancy. Isn't that a good thing? Are we getting better? But are we? Is I that good? <laughs> yeah, and I don't think that's actually totally accurate. So okay. I work with a group, uh, Gaggle, and they have like 5.2 million kids that they oversee and 1,500 schools are searched across the United States. So it's, oh, a, wow. it's a massive amount of data. So 2019 to 2021, those two years of school, you're looking at massive increases in like the amount of elementary school kids, for instance, that are, are talking about and communicating about drugs and alcohol that we didn't see before, hmm. which is like during the pandemic, right? Yeah. 2019, 2020. So parents were doing it, right? Monkey see, monkey do. And so you had a lot of kids that had access to things and boredom on their side. You had like that isolate effect where we were all locked down for a period of time and kids couldn't get to one another. So if you ask a child how they define sex, 
versus what, how we're defining it in this forgotten generation that is not boomer generation, yeah. right? If you ask a child how they define it, it's very different than how we would define sex. Because I what think do you that, mean by that? I think statistically, when you're asking, you're saying like, oh, but they're having less sex than ever before. If you're talking about, and the media is talking about intercourse. But if you talk about sex as interactions between children or between individuals that are sexual in nature that aren't specifically intercourse, then that's happening at a massive rate. What's going on there? Is it more understanding about pregnancy? So we're just doing a lot of other stuff instead? Is that what's happening? I think like someone on your staff was talking about it, the transactional nature and how fast it can be, right? Swipe left, swipe, swipe, swipe left. right yeah. thing. There was a study that came out that 28% of millennials check their phones during sex. <laughs> Check their phones during sex. During sex, I'm just right? to say that's not very good sex if you're checking right. your phone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, where's the intimacy and the emotional connection? And so, and how are they defining it? So that, that's where I would start. I think this also feels like it speaks to like definitions of maturity. You know, what is a mature relationship? What has changed in, in this generation about relationships? This generation, I would say, is having a hard time really diving into the depths of like the emotional connection with people. So it's more about the possession or it's about this is mine, here's my label, here's my girlfriend, or this is my whatever. So once you get to that level, then it's about can I keep it? And it's like a win or lose kind of like mentality oftentimes. And it's really more about who do I have on my hit list? Like there's all these terms that these kids have. And Wait, uh, help, help I know. unpack this a little bit for me. I know, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna... worried for you if I tell uh, you all. <laughs> <laughs> well, last time we went we went down some dark uh, Quantico doors. What, okay. what new horrors do you have for me now? <laughs> well, so it's not a negative to have had multiple partners that I'm like having sexual interactions with as a teenager. And in fact, they publicly share these quote unquote hit lists. And there's only a certain level that if you cross over, they call it kind of a run through girl. I don't understand how you get from pride to, you know, this journey of hell where now everybody calls you this other name. So there's like this weird dichotomy that's happening in this generation where they're like proud and like kind of really open about who they've been with and they're excited about it. This piece about them that again, like I'm actually having sex. It was just like a thing that we did because I got a ride or they did me a favor. You know, there's like that piece of it. So to me, it's very disconnected in terms of like the intimacy that we need if we're gonna have a partner that we're, we really truly want to have that relationship with. I mean, I think we should jump into talking about pornography because yep. this it's like that this- Try um, to dance around it. <laughs> it's on my list. Okay. And paint a picture for me of the current state of our kids' relationship with pornography. It's a lot to unpack because, <laughs> you know, the average age is, we talked about in the last time, is eight, right? Chronic viewing begins at 11. There's multiple cases that I've had in my practice where I have 20-something-year-olds that present with erectile dysfunction, like they can't even have an erection because they've had so much exposure to pornography. And, and porn is not all equal. To me, I was terrified. I'm like, are we raising a generation of pedophiles? Because you've got a bunch of kids that are like in these elementary, middle school years, having their first sexual experience. And now as they age out into their 30s, their connection with sex really started when they were young. So do we have a bunch of people that are no longer enticed because their first sexual like connection is at that young age. Oh, that's really a weird and horrible thing to think about. Right. Um. <laughs> so, so there, there's that. Right off part. The okay, we're we're in the dark. Okay, I know. Okay. I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm this, sorry. This, no we're not, I took us here. Let's stay yeah. here. All so, right. and there's and and again, like I think that if you look at the industry, we in the United States by far are the number one consumers, and you can go of on pornography. Of pornography. If you go on Pornhub, they actually do the stats for you. It's kind of exciting, and they show you we're like, we're winning. We're number one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's winning. Great. Yeah. Great. And, and you've got teen is the number one searched term in pornography, which is terrifying. So you have to look through and say like, okay, where is the injury? Where's the harm in that? If you are introducing sex in a way that is so obviously not real and that they think that that might be real, there's no, there's no real life experience that will, that will make up for what they're watching is scripted nature of like how porn is presented to these kids. Help me understand like the nature of your experience in dealing with families and kids 
where porn has become a problem. So a lot of my cases involve this because I think it's naturally, it's the one thing that gets really unsettled and parents- And for people who are just jumping in yeah. to this for the first time with us together, what do you mean by case? So if a, if a family comes to me and like, I'm a psychologist. So mm -hmm. if they come to me and it's a, it's a patient, they're coming in and there's like some sort of issue psychologically, a large majority of them have been exposed and are struggling with the psychological ramifications of that. It's hard as a kid, if you think about it, it's hard if you are exposed to something that is a natural drive, right? Food, water, and sex. And so it's yeah. a natural drive. You get exposed to something you're not used to, you're not really sure about it, you're curious, but then you feel bad about it because you know you're not supposed to be doing it. So, right. it, and you can't really talk to your adults about it. So now you live in this life of, my parents are looking at me, my mom's trying to give me a hug, and now I don't really, know how to handle that. And so it causes a lot of anxiety, it causes depression, it causes a lot of um, PTSD sometimes in kids because they don't really know how to shut down some of those graphic images that are coming into their, into their brains. You said that eight years old is the average age in which our kids today are being exposed to pornography for the first time. Yes. That's prepubescent. That's like- Second grade. You're only beginning to be like a person. Like, you know, the age of reason is seven. So what happens to an eight-year-old who sees these images and doesn't have context for what that even is? Like, what is going on? What are these people doing to, with each other? Usually one of two ways. Either they get scared and they turn it off and, and you don't really hear much about it until maybe they're asked later, like, hey, like, has this happened? Like, how old were you? And they're like, oh yeah, like I remember that one time. And they don't really jump into it. The other thing that happens is that they're exposed to it and then they're like, hey, I wanna show my friend because I don't wanna do this alone. And so now we start to have like incidental exposures that are happening to other classmates. And then it becomes a bigger thing because typically, I mean, elementary school, middle school kids, not great at secrets. <laughs> so the more you bring into that, the more it gets public and then some parent will find out and then there's like a, a conversation that happens. Is this mostly boys? They get exposed at equal rates because of how it works. And, and if you look at what happens is in second grade, when the, at that age of eight, that's when they're searching terms online for schoolwork. And so because we ad bundle and we, we're trying to get more eyes on things, that's how they get exposed typically. So you're saying that the pornography industry is effectively buying search terms against Correct. second grade social studies curriculum. Correct. In order, to get exposure because they have 10 years, oh, that's really even heinous. more. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, it's, the business model has worked. I, I got incensed. I was watching uh, um, Elon Musk had, had published like his first board meeting on SpaceX and I was like kind of nerding out. I was like, this is super cool. So I click into it and all of a sudden there's porn on the side of my thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is ridiculous. And I'm like calling everyone I know, like trying to get Elon to understand, oh, like he's got this attached to it. Kids and, like Elon Musk and SpaceX and it's all, it's cool. And yeah, an you should know about it. Yeah. And I, nobody cared. Nobody cared. And I was like, wow, you've got billions of people like that are probably watching this and it's attached to it. So it truly is to me like a very calculated run at trying to corrupt our young generation. So boys and girls are getting exposed around second grade. Help me understand what is going on at that age. What's going on with them as far as their sexual identity, their sense of what sex is? Like, so if you if you look at it from a perspective, just physically, yeah. like everything looks different, right? You're prepubescent. You're not going to look like the videos that are being presented to yourself, and so you're immediately like thrust into this position of where is it that I fit in this? Because that's nothing like. Is that what things are going to be like? Is that what it's going to look like? I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not there, so I'm not. That's not good, right? Like, I need this is what it needs to be, and so like, there's this crisis in that space of like, will I ever be enough, or will I ever look like that, or will I do that? So there's like, I've had typically boys talk about that, right? And I, it's not a fair representation of what anything should go like or anything. So there's this crisis of this is how I think I need to interact. And my work a lot of times with them is, you know, girls don't show up and just like tell you they want to take their clothes off, and like, you know, bend over. Like, that's not how it goes. Like, you need to have a conversation and you need to be kind and you need to, right? Like all of those things. So 
So there's the the physical piece of them at that age is struggles with like how do I have a relationship? And now I'm yeah, looking at my body at my, looks nothing like that. Looks nothing like that. And if I'm a girl, my body in both right, sides. Right, but I still have the feelings of like I might have a crush on my my the girl that sits next to me in class, or we might be friends on the playground. And now I've got this narrative running in my head about what, what, am I going to do that to her? Like, which is terrifying for me to look at and say yeah. like you've got these these kids now trying to care about someone but really fighting this kind of natural urge that they've been introduced to and and that's the, the biggest challenge that i see like of having those conversations with our kids and with our families how is this impacting boys and girls differently are there differences in the in in the experience at that young prepubescent really super confusing age who's given eight-year-olds the sex talk as parents right probably I, I, I gotta imagine not many. No, hardly any. Girls are more social. They're more they're more amenable to talking. They tend to be a little bit more, in my opinion, go to parents more at that age and say if they see something. And and at that age, like the boys and girls are pretty separate already. Yeah. Like they they might be friends, but there's definitely alliances have been like have been taken. Yeah. They're at that still point. icky. There's still the icky factor. Yes. Yeah. So it's a little bit separate in that way. It's traumatic, I think, more for them. And I think that if you think about what it must look like as a child, yeah. it's almost like witnessing an assault take place. Well, right. And so... <laughs> like, what's what's he doing to her? What's right. she doing to him? What What's this? This all looks like pain. Is this painful? What's happening? Like, there's a lot of stuff that you can... Right. If you try to put yourself in a beginner's mind. Right. And not understanding it. And to your point of, like, our kids having less sex? And it's like, well, were they presented something that is terrifying? And so maybe it's easier to do things that don't look like that. It's to be seen how difficult and how challenging it's going to be unwrapping some of that, like in terms of years of after the, that exposure at that age. I mean, trying to put myself back and I'm going to say something really like personally embarrassing, but it's like, I remember when I was little, I remember asking my mom, like, I didn't know what my testicles were for. Right. I, I remember that pretty acutely because it was, you know, a weird, we remember these things. The right, fact that right. I even remember that moment with clarity is itself kind of interesting. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of conversations I remember before the age of nine mm -hmm. with clarity, but that is one. This must be radically changing the way kids approach their parents or don't about their own bodies. Like what's happening there? So asking about what a part is that everyone has and like getting that explained is very different than going to a parent and asking what an action is that the parent may not even understand or know how to respond to. And then I feel like that we, as a parent, we're trying to protect our kids. Yeah. And so like protect them from this. And so do we come in and as our first reaction, anger, frustration, we're fearful, right? We, this bad thing right. just happened and now right. we've just assigned that with it's, a negative energy versus- It's very traumatic. Yeah, very it's, traumatic. I'm, my kid, my, my, my little eight year old baby yeah. comes to me and describes something that I am instantly horrified she's describing that she's seen. What's your advice? What should I do as a parent? I would say, first of all, take a deep breath. Like, let's talk through, like, how is it that this happened? Like, how are you feeling about it? Let's talk about what is okay and what's not okay, but very similar to the way that you might watch a TV show on TV where you have actors and you have people that like put on wigs and put on makeup and they do all the things. Like there's also this other thing that we have actors and they do these things, right? Like I think that you explain to them at their age, right? If I have an eight year old and like, and, and ask them what it is that they would like to know about it. How is it making you feel? Like, are you okay? Like I'm here to answer those questions, right? Like, I just think that if we don't work on destigmatizing it and we don't get ahead of it and talk to our kids first about it and they kind of silently go through it without us, we've lost, right? And, and they're going to make their own assumptions and they're not going to probably put the best context on. And they'll probably overuse and, and do things with that and end up in places that I've seen that, you know, escalate. Um, in dangerous ways. Do you feel as a psychologist that works with families that, you know what, they're gonna get exposed. So you should have this conversation at seven or eight years old. And what should that conversation even be? How much of a birds and the bees do you get into at that age? My recommendation is always like, if you're deciding to hand over access to the internet with your child, have the conversation before that. 
The minute you hand them access online is the minute that you lose control and the potential could happen. If you're not okay taking your eight-year-old and dropping them off at a stadium of 80,000 people that are there to watch a game and pick them up four hours later, then why are you letting them go online with five billion people? Why are you letting them go and explore the dark recesses of the online world without holding their hand and explaining it to them. I just think we have to be more realistic in that sense. And I think it starts even earlier than that. I think children, even in that toddler phase and elementary school age before the age of eight, there's a lot of self-exploration of body parts and like in baths and like, you know, things happen, right? I remember my son, you know, he, like, he was in the bathtub and he was like, what's this mommy? And I was like, sometimes that happens. And I went and got my husband. I was like, you should probably talk about this. Like, you know, like, I, I didn't make right. it weird. I was just like, sometimes that happens, right? And I was like, those are the conversations of like, okay, this does happen. This is a natural reaction in your body and you should have these conversations. Same thing with young girls of understanding that you can't, it's okay to love your body and love who you are and that this is a part of us being human. If we talk about it in those ways then it doesn't make it seem like it's bad and it shouldn't be bad, right? How we present it is, is really the fundamental issue here. So we get old into this older zone, and you talked about some of these movements that have happened in cells and this, this, this like sort of relational dysfunction that's going on. What does pornography access and, and use do to teenagers? Let's add another layer then and put on the VR headset. So what we know, like in the virtual reality world, we have like 100,000 videos per month being developed in porn. Wow. And it's always you, been the leading edge of technology. <laughs> so you put that on and I, and I watched a demonstration on it. And so you put that on and then you add in a haptic technology. Haptic technology is like, imagine a yoga pant and you put on yoga pants. And now if you have a, a young woman crawling up your legs to come to you, you feel the heat and the pressure from the haptic technology in a VR world. So we're getting into the like world in which there's no more, there's no more reproduction on planet Earth. <laughs> right, so you, you could uh, potentially lose a generation of young men that would be able to be stimulated and satisfied without ever having a connection with another human. Break this apart for me. So what is it that this exposure does to, let's just stick with boys, what's happening there that's fundamentally unhealthy? Most importantly to me would be consent, right? A lot of porn, and again, it goes, all porn is not created equal, right? You've got regular porn, if you wanna think of it that way, you have aggressive, you have rape porn, you have bestiality, you have, there's, I, I wanna yeah. say last time I checked was like 130 different categories or something like that. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of different like nuances in that. But I think that consent and the work that I do, it seems very non-consensual and it doesn't seem like it is, it is something that um, both parties are kind of in the same place with. So that bothers me the, the most. The other part I think is that ability to turn on, like as a teenage boy is talking about it, like if, if you can just like watch something and in three minutes, like you're where you need to be, that's not really how in real life you're gonna interact with a girlfriend. And that's not really how you're going to get aroused in real life, unless you're asking her to watch that with you. There's a disconnect and it's harder or it's different. And so if it's easier to do it without a person there, then why wouldn't you just do that? Like, so how do you connect the dots for that? So you had mentioned- um... Having never been a teenage boy <laughs> myself. Well, you had mentioned, you had mentioned like, 20 year old erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Do you have numbers on that, what that, what that looks like? I don't know like? the statistics. I just know like it was hard for me to connect the dots in the beginning. This is like 10 years ago and thinking, oh I know my it's gosh, gone up substantially. I, yeah. And it can't have the same flood into that dopamine reward pathway. It gets just indoctrinated with this. This is my norm and this is what I need to see. I mean, I've like marriage is falling apart over it. It's, it's terrifying. There seems to be a feedback loop. You know, my conversation with Warren Farrell touched on this. There's like a ratchet effect mm -hmm. of it getting more and more extreme the more time you spend with it. Is that actually what's happening? It's exactly what happens. Biologically, that your brain is like not, it's just like, nah, that's boring, that's not interesting. Two things, I think, yes, there is a ratcheting effect and you need more in order to get the same reaction that you had. But I also think that they tie in and start to introduce the same way they do in other words, like, if you like this, you're gonna like that. 
But I think that that's it. Like they start to track you and they start to like give you and introduce things. And then you can understand like how they get to that place because I shouldn't have, you know, 20 something or 30 year olds that are having like problems or trying to download like child porn or rape porn or those kinds of things, unless there's some sort of dysfunctional path that got them there. That's just not a normal behavior. As a dad, what advice do you have for me for how to talk to my son, not just as a kid, but even as he gets older, about porn and sexual relationships? Sitting down and saying, like, here's the good, the bad, and the ugly of everything, right? And say, like, there is this industry, and it is an industry that is built on selling a product to a consumer that has this natural need. And consuming that for any sort of recreational purposes, if you're with a partner and you're both consenting to that is very different than individually consuming that and then getting taken into these kind of like nefarious areas on it. Two adults that want to watch pornography, like I'm not against it, but understand what the industry is, understand how maybe some of the people got into the industry, maybe understand them as humans, understand whether or not that's what you want to support or not support. Right. You had mentioned off the air, so to speak, your work with human trafficking mm -hmm. uh, organizations. But where have you seen the connectivity there? Because in, again, one of the nice things about Gen Z, although it gets perverted, is that they are very socially conscious as a generation. What should I tell my kids about the connection between porn and human trafficking? You know, I think specifically it's connected in ways that it's a consumable, right? And when you have somebody who has a need to be met and you can't find maybe a natural partner, they're going to go out and try to buy that natural partner. It's it's almost like, you know, you can always tell if it's not somebody's for if they're a serial killer, it's not their first kill because of the, some of the I know it's getting dark, but but like you can tell getting into the there's Quantico some, time, right, the, but, your FBI time. But there but there's some certain things, right, that you can tell. And so in the trafficking world, a lot of times that you've got women and you have consumers that come in that really are replaying and looking to kind of play out some of these fantasies that they see in the porn industry. Because you can go in, you can buy a product. A lot of times now we're seeing a lot of the post drug dealers, right? That you you have to buy a product to sell and then the, the product is gone, whereas you can resell a product if it's a human. And so we're seeing a huge amount of trafficking that is, is increasing because they realize that they know how to do this and they're really good businessmen and they, they tend to know how to manage their, their products better. Am I hearing that you're saying that there's like a movement from drug dealers into human traffickers? A lot of ex-drug dealers have moved into trafficking. Is there any advice you have for parents from a tools perspective for how to try to protect our kids as best we can from you know, unhealthy exposure to pornography? There's definitely like screen monitoring and like ways to put on protections. Like you could put in age, like I think my kids are 14 and 15 now. And I think that online they show that they're six and seven because I was like way ahead of the game. I'm like, I know I need to put their date way later. You know? Oh, so like you put their age, you make them their age yeah. younger whenever there's an age a cor correct. thing. Yeah, I make them much younger because in the US we have COPA. They've decided that the online protection of our children is over at 13 and after 13, you don't have to protect them anymore, which I find insane. So I made them younger in order to protect them. So it's, a, it's like a simple hack that you can do, hmm. but manage what they're looking at and what they're seeing. If you're gonna let them on YouTube, YouTube Kids does a much better job monitoring that, right? Once they get into their high school years, that's they're not gonna be happy with YouTube Kids. Yeah. But when they're younger, right, you can do that and you can explain to them, here's why we're doing this and this is what I'm trying to protect you from. And then they tend to be better reporters if you are honest with them on why you're trying to protect them. Have you dug in at all that like, you know, Disney has like the circle, there's these sort of like VPN like filters yeah. systems. Do you feel like they, do you feel like we've got pretty good tools at we our do disposal? Have some, yeah, I, I mean, I think that circle is good. Family time iOS is like a really good one. There's a buddy of mine, is, yeah. you know, uh, works at a company called Canopy that, that uses a, like AI, AI to. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. To I, try to filter things and. Yeah, I, I think all of the tools that are out there, use them. And I think as a parent, you have to know that you can't protect them from everything. We can't bubble wrap them and pretend like the, the tools are gonna They'll stop it. They'll just grab their buddy's phone. <laughs> right, but like maybe instead of 100 exposures, they're only gonna have five. That's way better from a psychological perspective. And so use the tools that you can, have the conversation so that you can 
make sure that they're they're making the good choices. Online. So just because I know that they can still probably get around it, that shouldn't make me throw out my hands. I should still use the stuff. I would still use it. Absolutely. I think sometimes parents like they're like, well, it's pretty expensive. It's seven ninety nine a month or it's ten ninety nine a month. And I was like, do you go to Starbucks? Like, <laughs> how much are you spending? Like, right? Are you auto loading that card? Look at where you're putting your investment. Is there anything more valuable to you than your child? And and think through like, is it worth it? To me, it always has been. While we were grabbing lunch together, you showed me a fairly disturbing YouTube video from Grand Theft Auto. This is our transition to the discussion Gaming. of video games. Okay. Now, I am a gamer for a long time. Let's talk about video games as a whole. What's your take? Are they good, are they bad? I'm sure it's somewhere in between, but like, how do you think about the role video games play in the health of our kids? I think that there's some that are great and some that can be collaborative. Like fun fact, during COVID, the number one video game cohort was like 35 year old women. So I think all the moms- 35 year old women? Yeah, they were like jumping. I think that- Which game was this? I don't, or no, games? Th th it was just like, who's like jumping on to gaming oh, at the highest for the first rate. Time, yeah. yeah, and so it was COVID. Like, I think these yeah. moms were trying to figure out how to participate with my child because we were yeah. all locked in, right? So I thought that was kind of interesting because it was a collaborative, fun, behavior and thing that you could do together. I think that they're not all made equal, obviously. Grand Theft Auto is not a driving game. <laughs> um, but they have like some protections in place where it's kind of like the old TV PG R yeah, rated, there's a things like system. that, right? So that rating system is helpful. Personally, looking at the science of the brain reaction, like violent video games, first person shooters, to me are damaging, too damaging. Like I wouldn't want anybody that I loved on them. Really? And I'm sorry. No, developing <laughs> brains and sensitivity, right? Like, do you have a child who's more empathetic in nature or do you have a child who isn't? Shockingly, having done the crazy stuff I've done, to me, I'm very sensitive as a person. And so like, if I watch too much violent content, it starts to like erode into me. So like, if you have a child that, that is like that, like maybe it wouldn't be okay for them to like play those games. Stick to Mario Brothers. Or NBA or football or some of those things, which although those ones are getting a little bit more kind of on the dicey side, you know, these <laughs> days, you know, it's John Madden, you know, rest his soul. Like, <laughs> it, is, it is not the same Madden game as it used to be. But you look at those things as a parent and like participate, sit down with them and do that. But the the, the violent video games and some of these games that have explicit ratings, like to me that it's just, you're introducing this place that can like hurt a child and it makes their brain fire up similar to like somebody in the military. So you can see that on the scans. So I remember Tipper Gore and Joe Lieberman and there was this whole cohort of politicians in the nineties who were really all up in arms about how violent video games are corrupting our youth and the reason for gun violence and all this sort of stuff. My understanding is that the, the, the attempts to research this have not borne out that that's true, that there's not been a correlation between playing violent video games and, and actually taking that out in the real world. Is, true. Is yeah. that, am I right yeah, about that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so, and I was actually part of that APA, like we like oh, wow. dove in and it was really interesting because I think I was maybe 30 years younger than anybody on the panel. <laughs> like, you know, it's like all of these kind of like psychologists like looking at all the research and this meta analysis. And there really isn't any connection that shows violent video games begets violent behavior. Violent video games does increase aggressive behavior and aggressive tendencies, but it doesn't create an actionable. So you have to think about it. your brain is highlighted, like you're playing a first person shooting game, right? And you're like They're crawling around. <laughs> so yeah, super fun, right? Like, and I've watched, I've watched many of them, like, and I, and, and I was on this whole yeah. thing. But if you look at yourself and you feel yourself and how fun you are, like in that moment, and then you ask yourself really, how long does it take me to kind of settle down and get to a relaxed state? It's probably gonna be about, 30 to 40 minutes later before you calm down. This is really interesting because this is something I've observed. So my, um, you know, my son is a gamer. Mm -hmm. All of them are online connected. He's on with his buddies in a discord channel and they're having basically like a phone con. Well, it's more than a phone conversation because they're all screaming like lunatics right. all the time. <laughs> right. There's hard stuff to disentangle here mm -hmm. with his experience. And I think this is, I, I, I want to understand how you think about this socially. Help me think about what is good and healthy in terms of gaming, not about the violence, but just about gaming and the time that's spent and the like casino-like elements and what's unhealthy. Because I have, I also noticed with him growing up, there is like a ramp down period. Like if he's been 
on, in an intense game, when he comes out of it, it's like he's like zombified. Disentangle this for me. What's good? What's unhealthy? How should I distinguish these things? So I, I like the social aspect. I think like having a community that you belong to is great. A lot of them use Discord and as anything in technology, the good comes the bad, right? You can be part of a server that is private with your friends, or you could be part of like a global simp server, which you probably don't want your child to be part of, right? A global so, simp server? Yeah. What's yeah. this? Just a, a simp. Is, I know what a simp yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I do. Yeah. But what is a global simp? Well, server? just like it's open, right? And so anybody can kind of join into it. And so you'll see these factions. And of they're kids. all pathetic together? What's the. <laughs> why, I mean, would I, self, why would you self identify this? I, I have no idea. But, but, they can, but it's a belonging, right? We have, we have somebody who gets us. And, and then you've got women in those servers that, you know, like to participate and like the things I have seen are not normal and they're not typical. So okay. they are able to stay connected. And I think that that's a great thing. And I think that as long as you have an understanding of who you're talking to and who's in that group, yeah. fantastic. That goes back to that dichotomy of IRL and like online. And are you, do you really know and appreciate who you're dealing with? I just had a case where um, somebody presented and she was just horrified that somebody in her discord server was threatening to come and like kill her family and that yes. if she didn't stop talking to this other person in the server because this person like you know and it's like okay how does a 14 year old navigate that right and death so death threats from strangers right and I, and I worry a little bit about like younger kids like having headsets on where we can't it's not open right I always say like the headset thing like really bothers me because from a psychology standpoint, if, if I'm piping in really caustic, like hurtful behaviors and language, it's going to make me feel bad as a person and now nobody else can see that. So that makes me a little bit concerned on that end. The good parts, if you're with people you love and you care about and they're friends and everybody is happy about that, fantastic. It helps you stay connected. So I don't have any problem with that. There's a psychologist, Peter Gray, who's written a oh. book called um, Free to Learn. I, I interviewed him several years ago. And the book is great. It's, it's mostly about education, about school. And he's basically like top down, sit in, a, sit in a desk, school sucks. It's antithetical to everything we know about how the way humans learn. He basically said that open world collaborative games like World of Warcraft aren't as good as going outside together and playing in the, in the front yard, but they're better than nothing in a world where our kids are no longer doing that the way they used to. How do you think about moderating that? We did a rule on our, my own home that we didn't have any video games from Monday through f Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you could earn your minutes. And in my house, you could earn your minutes if you, ha you play a musical instrument and you did a sport. I don't care what the sport is. You start a sport, you finish the sport. That's how I, we've managed it. And that's what I recommend is like looking at that balance of are we actually building them up physically and emotionally and socially in ways that afford them to have those minutes online. In our last conversation, you talked about something called process addiction. Mm -hmm. And I know in your writing, you, you know, one of the examples you use of a process addiction versus a chemical addiction is gambling. There's a lot of stuff that in video games that are directly derived from like the insights from the casinos. <laughs> the most obvious ones are like the short games, the sort of Zynga games that have the same exact Candy sounds, Crush. Candy yeah. Crush, you know. How should I understand like the impact that the stimulation of, of games has on the brain? I have a great video of a World of Warcraft uh, kid whose mom deleted his account. I use that often, he's like a teenager and he loses his mind. I try to share it with parents and I say, you know, this is their identity. They're so connected and it's their entire world. It would be like me coming in and taking your entire resume, burning it and saying, none of that matters. None of the school you did, none of the experience that you had, it's, you have got to start from scratch because that's their whole identity. And so when you have a child that gets to that point, that's where I would say that there's that addictive or overuse, like that you're at that place where if they're dependent on it and that that's all that matters to them, now you've got yourself a problem and you should look at how do we unwind that. I think that there's genetic components in that. I think that there's behavioral, emotional components in it. I think that you look at the family and say like, okay, what is it that everybody else in the family is doing? You know, are they, we all kind of isolated and we're all on our own screens and yeah. nobody's really paying attention. That happens too. Are there time guardrails? I think you had mentioned something like two hours a day for screen time in general. One of the things that's weird about screen time is there's different screen time. Mm -hmm. So there's homework on the computer. There's 
being on Instagram. There's playing WoW with your buddies. There's composing. My son loves music. He's actually like taught himself Apple Logic and builds songs, like beats and stuff in, in Logic. Each of those is like a fundamentally different kind of activity. It's still on a self-illuminating screen 24 inches from his eyes. So how should I think about limits and parsing the differences between homework versus games versus social versus internet browsing and YouTube versus content consumption, like just binging The Office on Netflix? So it's a great point because it's not all made equally. And I think I look at it as a digital diet. I look at the pyramid, right? Like if you look at the fact that that base of educational media, creative media, I love the fact that he's like using something to create something independent and unique to himself. Apple Logic, that is using tech as a tool, not yeah. as a toy. So the quick line that I teach parents is like, is it tech as a tool or is it a toy? So if it's educational, it's a tool. If it's creative, it's a tool. Are they doing art? Are they doing something that's using their brain and that creativity, which is fantastic. If it's a toy, meaning I'm just gaming or I'm hanging out with my friends or something like that, what I would say is less than two hours of that media. Of toy time. Of toy time. Yeah, and, and that's where you get into kind of like those places that I worry about if it's more than that. And then what about Minecraft? I remember he like taught himself the scripting language for how to build, use command blocks to do automation things so that he could be a bear because he was like replacing himself with the bear as he ran around. It's like, is that toy? Is that tool? Minecraft is a kind of Lego. Mm -hmm. So how should I think about stuff, stuff like that? There's some things like that that sit in the middle. It does seem like it sits in the middle. And I think that if you've got a kid that's learning coding, and I tell every parent I can get my hands on, like, teach your child how to code. Like, this is the future of America. And those of us that don't know how to code are probably screwed. So we should know and understand that language. So good for him. But that he's taken that and blended it from a toy to a tool in order to make it work for him. You would ask yourself like, okay, that's what he's doing. And it's kind of like your Legos, but does he have an outside balance? Is he physical in any sense? Is he yeah. doing anything outside? Does he, you know, what's his cardiovascular like health system and health and all of those things? Like, are we taking care of that piece of it? That part still needs to be nurtured. The digital universe gaming um, Discord platforms. This is, this is all fun. It all it's all fundamentally social. This transitions us to this to the next and sort of final thing I'm going to talk to you about today, which is cyberbullying. Can you give me a little bit of a primer on what's going on on these digital platforms? So I would say anything that you remember as a kid of where somebody was like mean to you or picked on you or those kind of things happens in the digital world. Cyberbullying had put a lot of labels around it and there's different things that can happen. There can be flaming, there can be ostracizing, there can be all of these different kind of categories of it. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is it's like somebody is in an online situation and somebody else in that online situation is able to create harm and make you feel bad. And that pain and that hurt if you ask them to stop and it continues, that's the one category that they require on cyberbullying, is that you have to have asked them to stop and they didn't. Oh, interesting. Right? So in terms of under legal definitions, cyberbullying happens every day. And kids normalize it at this point because they're like, oh yeah, that's just Joe. Like he, like he got mad and he just spouted off or whatever. But when you're targeted, that's the case I think that you're talking about is like you're being targeted because you're different or you're something like about it. One thing I've heard is I got bullied as a kid. I think most, you know, most people get bullied in some way at some point in their lives. I kind of feel like we're overcompensating in our culture around talking about bullying. And maybe I'm way off on this. So I'm going to throw something yeah. out for you to push back on. Okay. Is a certain amount of bullying healthy because we have to toughen up? And does cyberbullying change the game compared to being like picked on in the physical world? So I'm sorry, right, that you were bullied because that, that does suck. <laughs> fine. Um, Screw and on. I got bullied when I was a kid because I wore hand me down clothes and, you know, didn't, you know, I probably smelled, I don't know. <laughs> but the difference was I could go home. And the difference was that you could go home and you were going into a, family and a unit that loved you and protected you. And unless somebody had your phone number that they could call you, you didn't have to see them. And you had this reprieve for a very specific amount of time where you could kind of regain your footing. Yeah. In the cyber world with the attachment of these devices and the need to constantly look to see that fear of missing something or, or somebody sent me a message and you're constantly always checking something and trying to stay in that 
that's where that cyberbullying changes things, in my opinion. And that's why we have these high rates of self-harm and suicide is because I think that there's no escaping and they don't have a safe space anymore. And the safe space would be, let's take away the device, which is like taking away part of their body. That's not gonna solve it. It's not ribbing at that point. It is calculated and it's painful and it's intentional. The word trauma gets abused mm -hmm. in our society, I think, today. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Yeah. But there is trauma. Trauma is real. Mm -hmm. Bullying can lead to trauma that's real. Mm -hmm. How should I understand what that is? Where has the line been crossed that my child's being traumatized? The pieces that I see the most injury in are the things that you can't change of yourself. So a lot of times they're much more sophisticated in their bullying. They're mm. much more calculated in it. So they're saying things to you about maybe that your family doesn't have X, Y, and Z, or the fact that you don't have access to go in the vacations that I do, or that you look a certain way, or you whatever. The things that you can't change about yourself. Cyberbullying has gotten very pointed to, towards those things where I'm really trying to hurt you, and I'm gonna say the worst thing I possibly can. And it's easier to do that behind a screen than it is to your face. One of the things that seems to be connected to this is, is FOMO and the, the like ability to be somewhere and pointedly say, hey, you're not here, like this sort of intentional exclusion or showing off. Is that part of the landscape? So there's a new app that just came out recently last year called Be Real. If I send you a notification, you have to post right this second. But if you don't, then it's gonna time shame you and it's gonna be like, oh, Lisa didn't post at that minute. She like did it an hour later, which is gonna show that like maybe I took time to put makeup on or it, like it, all of this like horribleness that happens with it. And everybody's like, no, 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 it's, it's be real. It's supposed to catch you in your moment of what you're doing instead of like these curated moments that we usually see on Instagram. And if right. you haven't seen Fake Famous, it's a fantastic documentary that came out during COVID. But Fake Famous really shows how you can create your own like influence status. And they, they literally take people, three people that are like completely oblivious and make them famous. It is fascinating because hmm. you see the psychological derailment that occurs in two out of the three of those people. But that's where I think like it, there is a fear of missing out, but it doesn't, I think it's more than that. I think it's really more about that one utsmanship of like, what am I doing versus what you're doing? Are you part of this party or not? All of those things. And that's why those apps are getting, they're so popular because and show that. It feels really hard as a parent to navigate because I feel like a dinosaur. I don't even know where I'd start. The language, the lingo, the what's important and what's not. I'm already a cringe factory, but it would be like, <laughs> like for the dads out there that have like a 13 year old daughter who's experiencing this stuff. How do we navigate this? How do we talk about it? How do we not be like so horrendously irrelevant seeming that we're completely unhelpful and just seem like we don't get it and leave me alone and they run to their room. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's tough because I think that that age group specifically is the most targeted and the most hurt by all of the social, particularly girls. And I think that if you as a parent or as a dad can really sit down and say like, I love you more than I do the yes to let you have this. And I love you enough to say no and fight this for you. I think if you can keep them off of it or in, and keep them understanding that, that's best. If you've already opened that Pandora's box and they're already there, I think then you have to be way more of an active like participant where you sit down and you say, like every Saturday we're gonna go and we're gonna get a coffee, we're gonna go for a ride and we're just gonna chill. And our tech stays home, you'd have to take off your watch. You, you know, and just <laughs> unplug and teach them in yeah. these little micro moments, it's okay. Somebody doesn't have to know where you are at all times. What do you say to the parent who hears, take it away, keep it away from them longer? It's too hard. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. all of her <laughs> friends have it and she's already feeling excluded, all you're doing is condemning her to total exclusion. It's a network effect problem. Mm -hmm. if, they, if all their friends are on it and I wanna hold the line for their mental health, how do I do that? I think you build those times and you build those experiences knowing that in the situation right at that moment, it may not feel like it's a payoff, right? Oh, I gotta go like with my dad and we're gonna go for a ride. We go every Saturday, but I promise you having done this for 20 years and being in therapy, the people that come into my office the most as adults come in and they're like, you know what, my dad didn't show up. 
or I was, you know, I was in the sport and I never had anybody like in the stands for me, or I didn't have this. It's not the people that are like, you know, like my dad, like actually like made me go fishing with him every weekend. And it was like the, you know, most irritating thing in the world. Those aren't the people I hear. And, and in fact, I did that for my dad. I said here for his 75th birthday, I picked 75 different things that he actually taught me. Like I hated learning how to change a tire. <laughs> I, I emptied oil in an oil pan and dumped it illegally, which I tell him, like, I, like you know, like I will we here at some a, point. I love that we created like, an EPA super fund yeah, together, yeah, exactly. Dad. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, all of these things. But but I know how to change oil. I know how to change a windshield wiper. I know how to change, put a dimmer switch in. I hated every time that he made me take that time with him at that moment because I was a teenager and I didn't want to have it. But I will never, ever have something more valuable to me than the time that he gave me and the tools that he taught me. So I, I just say push through. Teach them that they don't have, this isn't as important as this and being together and learning those things and doing those things. So what I'm not hearing is take it away. I'm hearing, um, and we talked about this in our last conversation, that it's, it is about having moderate, I mean moderation, moderation. in a cer certain yeah. sense, but also like healthy deprivation moments. Like right. The Orthodox Jews have it figured out with yeah. the <laughs> Saturday Sabbath. Yeah. Life. So I have a lot of Orthodox friends and they're yeah. like, yep, they shut it off. Yeah, just turn it off and like walk away. Yeah. I, I think that to me it's having quiet and peace and like having that space is what we don't give our kids. So if you can disengage and just say, look, it's not forever. We're just going to put it here and we're going to do this. We'll be back in an hour. And then you teach them that it's not the end of the world. It typically takes about two weeks of like showing them that pattern that it actually is okay, where they start to take it over and like actually appreciate and want that space because it feels more relaxing and it helps them. But it's usually about 14 days that I see that. If my son or daughter is being uh, bullied online, you know, so you've talked about one thing, which is just providing space to step away from that and mm -hmm. leave it, leave it there. What other tactics are at my disposal? So depending on your school, some schools handle it poorly, some schools handle it well. Most schools that I've talked to, I would say 99% of them have a zero bullying policy. So they are pretty much on top of it and don't allow it, particularly if it's under their their period of time that it's occurring on. So sometimes the school can be helpful, sometimes they can make it worse. So you kind of, your child- How so, how would they make it worse? They can make it worse by actually pulling the child into the office and saying, oh, like by the way, John told me that you're bullying him. Uh, is that true or not true? And then John goes out and tells everybody. Being a rat. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> so that's like, stitches end up in ditches is what the saying is for the kids, right? Um, so that can make it worse um, in that scenario. I mean, legislatively, if it's really bad, and I've had some cases that are really, really bad where there's like threats and things like that that are happening, then legally you can call any police station. And there's really? actually, yeah, there's harassment, stalking. There's all these cyber digital um, legislations that have come through. Uh, to protect you from a legal perspective in order to get law enforcement involved in order to shut that down. And then I think that the best way is to deal with it like with your child and say, all right, like how did this start? Like, how can I help you? Here's a couple of things. I talk about uh, green, yellow, and red to parents. And I was like, a green moment is a child that can handle it themselves. A yellow moment is they're not really sure it's causing them conflict and we they don't know if they need an adult to help them or not. And red is my child is distressed and I need to step in and take this off their plate. And so anytime it gets from that yellow red zone, I, I sit down and say, hey, these are the things that we could do. How about we have a conversation? And, and I usually find that other parents don't like their kid to be a bully and we can have conversations about that and like handle it directly that way. If you've got a teenage son or daughter and they come home and you say, how's school, how's life? Fine, is probably the answer you get. Are there things I can look for that would indicate that something's going on that they're not talking to me about? A lot of times you'll have um, isolation, like where they're pulling themselves out, they're withdrawing from like things that they were normally like, interested in. Like you'd watch a show with them and they didn't want to do it anymore. They're going to their room. Look at behavioral changes in the sense of maybe being irritable, like fighting back, like being really short-tempered, those kind of things, mm -hmm. uh, which I know sounds like a normal middle school. <laughs> 
like a high yeah. school student generally. So it's hard. But it, but if as a parent you get that feeling that there's something that's changing in them and you see those changes, like you see them kind of pulling back and they're just like not smiling as much or they're not kind of getting out of the groove and not playing with the dog or the cat or whatever it is. Like those are like the key signs that I say like you need to have a conversation and say like, hey, I'm worried. Parents sometimes think that if you talk about it, it makes it happen. And that's not true. Having a conversation and saying, hey, I'm checking in with you. I heard this story. There's this kid. He was like under a lot of stress. Parents had no idea. And I just realized like we haven't had this talk. Like how are things going with you? How about your friends? Right? Do it in a way where it's like, you know, anybody struggling in, in your world. And a lot of times kids know about other kids. We as the parent layer don't know about it. Yeah. So having those conversations, like everybody okay in your circle? What are you burdening? Because a lot of kids end up being these kind of micro therapists for each other and they don't really have the tools. They have therapy TikTok. Yes, they have therapy TikTok. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not always a sound piece of advice. Off the bus. <laughs> um, one of the things I've heard from a lot of different people is that family dinner is this really special thing. Do you see that the same way? It's a mindset. So a family dinner is establishing and creating boundaries and permission and expectations of everyone that this is special. You could do the same thing at night. Like I tuck my kids to bed, they'll be horrified, but I tuck them into bed every night. And, and every night, it, whether or not my daughter and I are arguing or not, she's like, you're gonna tuck me in, right? Right, like and that's a special moment in I time. do the same thing with my son. We, yeah. we say a prayer every night. We yeah. have since he was a, a baby, I still, I did it last night. Yeah. Yeah. He's 17. He right. might, he's probably embarrassed I've said this. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's okay. Because that's special. Oh. That's a special sacred time where whether you pray or not, but that moment that you have carved out to have a ritual and have something where you actually connect with someone and it's special to you, that's what matters. So I know that the dinner is a nice placeholder. I think that that's why the statistics bear that out. But I really would say it's really more about the Saturday drive with dad. Is there anything in our time together that you know, we haven't had a chance to talk about that as a dad, you feel like we really, you really want to say or that we really didn't get a chance to talk about here? One of the things that we didn't talk about is like who is responsible for this relationship, managing this technology. Oftentimes what I hear is one person manages it and the other one's like, they've got it. And so if Lisa has it and she's managing it, you don't really have to ask questions because you trust her. And so you don't always have all the insights and you don't really talk through. And it's a lot of ownership on whichever parent is managing that technology. And so I think that it makes a lot of sense to have that conversation with your spouse, really understanding like, what is, what is my role here, right? What is it that I can do? How can I support you? How tough is this being? Like, do you need a break from that? In the beginning, my marriage, like we would take turns doing the finances. And it was like, I just had this thing, like I never wanted to be like my mom. I wanted to always know like where everything was. And then pretty soon I was like, this is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I wanted to know, and I wanted to know that I could do it. And I think as dads, oftentimes they're burdened more often than not with the technology piece. And this is true. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's a lot. And I think taking a moment to recognize like you could miss something and that's okay. And understanding as dad, you're doing the best you can. And if you need help or you need to like talk to someone or whatever, like it's okay to be able to be that, that dad who reaches out and is like, how are you handling this or whatever? Because I think that I don't see that dad community talking as much as I do the mom community. I mean, that's what we're trying to do here with mm -hmm. Dad Saves America is, is model that, is yeah. to say, hey, we aren't as inclined to do that. So we're trying to throw our hat into the ring with, with this show and with these conversations. I think this is a good subject to kind of wrap out on. We have the ability to basically create a digital panopticon for our family. And, and I am living that because we got all kinds of cameras. And how do you think about what is and isn't good about that? Because that's part of our reality now. This sort of like, I've got a tracking device in my pocket or on my wrist at all times. And I know that. I think that's that privacy piece of like, we are all being watched, right? License plate readers on like all of our 
corners and all yeah. of the things. Like, it's really hard to disappear in today's society. The psychology of it for kids, I think a lot of times, that's a lot of that pushback from them, where they kind of intentionally push boundaries in ways and they're like, well, I know you know anyway. And it it's reminiscent of like a kid that might be like practicing a piano and like loudly saying, I know you're recording me to see if I do it or not, right? Back in the day, because they thought their parent was like tracking how many minutes that they spent online or play their piano or whatever. Um, now we actually get reports with graphs. Yeah, like, exactly. In our email yeah. inbox at the end of every day. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, we get notifications of our garage door opened or whatever. And yeah. so I think it, it creates this false sense of security for ourselves in, in many ways that we think that our kids are safer because they're being tracked. And that's not true. And I, th I think that parents should know that. I think ch that children are safer, the ones that are socially aware, the ones that are paying attention to their environment, the ones are that are not like this walking around. Well, that's the thing that's interesting about this because the safety net problem of this connectedness, it's kind of part and parcel with the helicopter parenting. It's like, it's, it's NSA parenting. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, well, I'm out doing whatever, but I know like I've got like a, real-time bat signal for mom or dad to show up if anything happens because my phone will notify them that there's something happening. So I know I don't have to really worry. Oh, absolutely. And it, but it's it's working in opposite ways in many cases. Like we had a lockdown at our school. A kid saw something happen. It happened to be a kid jumping over a fence with a computer charger, but the computer charger had fallen. And so the block was like moved and it looked, looked like it was like a gun. gun. And so the kids did what they were supposed to do and they reported it and a lockdown occurred. There were kids tweeting and sending stuff out in live time in reality and our, and our campus showing where they were, who was with them, all of the things we had, we had international reaction to the lockdown. This is, I live in Cave Creek, it's a little country town <laughs> off grid, like, is you know, and we've got international responses of, of people like weighing in because they wanted to be part of this frenzy. And the reality is, is they would have been much safer had none of those tweets gone out, right? Because if you really do have an active shooter, they hey, can shooter, track, here I am. Here I am. And, and I'm lot, in the science lab on the second floor. Yeah. And a lot of parents think it's safer, but the reality is it's not because now we as parents are like, I'm going to call my kid because they're in a lockdown. And if you have a gun, man, that's actually in that room and that phone goes off or the kid tries to answer it, where do you think the attention of the gunman's going to go? I feel obliged to say that don't worry, viewer, your kid's more likely to die from a lightning yes, strike it's true. than in a school shooting. Totally. <laughs> Absolutely. But I'm just... Your drive to school is more dangerous than any other yes. thing you're doing. <laughs> yes, yeah, and, and again, but. right, because not to fear monger, but I'm just saying yeah. like, we create these narratives in our head, like it's safer and it's right. not safer. And it's not safer to have like a, a location service. Like I, I will get home tonight and it doesn't matter whether you were able to track me or not, right? I, I, I want you to feel trust in that. And, and that's the part where I think we're teaching our kids, if we don't teach our kids that, that that's okay to go kind of unplug and like be okay off grid or those things. We're teaching them that constant surveillance is what is keeping you safe. Right. And it's not, that's not what's keeping you safe. It makes you feel that way from a psychological perspective because you have the data. And what it really creates is this need for more data and need for more time and screen time to pay attention to it. You know, the book, The Colony of the American Mind, talks about this like ideology of safetyism mm. that we've shifted, in a sense, from liberty, from risk-taking, to safety, culturally. We've spent a lot of our time together talking about the, the ways in which the digital landscape is unsafe for our kids. Mm. But how do you think about the kind of culture that we have, where we're heading, and, and where we maybe should be mindful it's a big question. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I worry a bit about this kind of futuristic, you know, calling something meta doesn't mean that that's what it is, right? We already have a virtual reality platform and people can go to go and come as they please. Building out a world where we can create avatars of ourselves and pretend like it's real life. Like if I can pick the clothes that I'm wearing and 
the, the house that I'm in and all of those things, I worry about that kind of digital divide that is occurring. You know, we, we're so, I guess, sensitive to the fact that we wanna make sure everybody ha is okay in this world, right? We, we have like all have a footing and we wanna make sure that their people aren't marginalized. Well, imagine yourself in a position where you you are in a space where you don't have enough, and and now you're in you've got this vi this virtual world where you can't even participate, or you can't even like go in there and feel whole. I worry about that because I feel like there's going to be kind of these factions that, that that are created, and different worlds like TikTok and TikTok Alt, and and so I, I don't know where that's going. I know that we can't stop it. Right. Uh, right. So yeah. I, I think that we have to really pay attention to that kind of moral, ethical guide of where where is that ethical ground and how do we teach this generation and the generations to come after that, that you are a, a steward of yourself in the real life and on these online worlds. And how do you become a better advocate and a better citizen in both of those places? I think it's a great place to, to stop. Lisa, thank you for being back on Dad Saves America. Thank you for having me again.